In my previous video, I tasked my girlfriend Ellie with squaring off against Dark Souls, a game she'd never touched, and analyzed how she did. It was a truly fascinating process, and one that seemed to resonate with a lot of you as well. Naturally, I've begun wondering how she'd fare with other titles that this medium offers. I decided it would be fun to jump right back into another experiment and see how Ellie fares against a different game. This time around, she'll be facing off against Bloodborne. Given that she's fresh off of Dark Souls, I was dying to see if the five hours she spent playing it would help her with another game developed by From Software. Bloodborne released in March of 2015, four years after Dark Souls, to massive critical acclaim. Overall, the two games are very similar, although Bloodborne tends to encourage a more aggressive style of play, something that Ellie already seemed to adopt in the last video. The ground rules are the same as they were last time. Ellie has five hours to get as far as she can into Bloodborne with very minimal assistance from me. Any ideas or tactics that she wants to implement as she plays are entirely fair game. So without further ado, let's jump in and see how she did. As the game began, Ellie took a couple of minutes to familiarize herself with the game's control scheme. She was also quick to familiarize herself with the game's menus, an element of Dark Souls that gave her trouble. While it certainly possesses its own feel, Bloodborne ultimately functions very similarly to Dark Souls, giving Ellie a distinct advantage over last time. Like that game, Bloodborne features a series of tutorials strewn around the ground, which Ellie read attentively. Bloodborne starts the player with no weapon, and since a lack of weapon was so problematic in the last video, Ellie immediately set off to find one. You're not actually able to secure a weapon until you die, but of course, Ellie didn't know this, so once she encountered enemies, she began fending them off as best she could. With only an arm, though, succeeding in combat is much easier said than done. She managed to survive for an impressive amount of time, bobbing and weaving between enemies, but eventually, Ellie bit the dust. It's at this point that Bloodborne presents an interesting departure from Dark Souls. Your first death in Bloodborne takes you to the Hunter's Dream, a small hub area where you can level up your character, strengthen your weapons, and just take a sigh of relief as this area doesn't pitch you against any enemies. It's a nice place to take a breather and features a number of additional tutorial messages. Ellie combed through them as thoroughly as she could and eventually stumbled onto some weapons up for grabs. She chose the axe for her melee weapon and also secured a gun as Bloodborne places important emphasis on firearms as a tool in combat. They act more as a support to your melee weapon, at least in my experience, so you likely won't kill a ton of enemies with them, but firearms can stagger enemies or just be used as bait to lure one enemy away from a larger group. After some more exploration, Ellie traveled back to Yarnum, the name of Bloodborne's world, and began pushing onward. With her weapons equipped, Ellie was able to eliminate the wolf near the beginning of the game and clean up the townsfolk that killed her earlier. With them out of the way, she climbed up a newly released ladder and lit a lamp, Bloodborne's equivalent to bonfires. Lamps not only serve as respawn points, but also allow the player to travel back to Hunter's Dream. So far, progression was much smoother than it was in Dark Souls. At this point, the player is released into the main world, which, like Dark Souls, is decidedly labyrinthine in nature. Despite possessing a similar structure to that of Lordran, Yarnum feels entirely distinct. It possesses a more gothic vibe, with endless stretches of cathedral-like architecture and torch-bearing townsfolk. It's pretty intimidating, to be honest, but Ellie jumped in with confidence. The first stretch of the game is centered around a road that leads into a town square of sorts. In the middle of that proverbial square is a bunch of angry townsfolk that appear to be burning some some kind of wolf at the stake. There are a few smaller groups of enemies on their way to this communal burning, which provides an opportunity to really begin practicing pugilism. Combat in Bloodborne functions pretty similarly to Dark Souls, and it was clear that Ellie's muscle memory was helping her out. She was able to handle most any single enemy and would generally only meet her demise when overwhelmed by multiple enemies at once. She could make it to the town square pretty consistently, but unfortunately for her, the square features a huge quantity of enemies, more than she ever faced at once playing Dark Souls. Ellie threw herself into the ring and was able to take out a respectable chunk of them, but always ended up being overwhelmed. It's difficult to peel a single enemy away in this section. Most attempts to do so end up resulting in attracting at least three or four, which can quickly overwhelm the player. Before Ellie had the chance to perform much experimentation, the first hour had come to a conclusion, marking the end of a very productive first leg. Feeling well, 
Ellie jumped right into Hour 2 and began trying to crack the code of this town square area. The section of the game is designed in a very challenging way, especially for such an early level. The sheer quantity of enemies is difficult in its own right, but the rigor runs deeper. One issue is that very little space of this area is actually safe. There's an elevated sidewalk on either side of the street that does provide some reprieve, but some of the enemies are armed with guns, able to fire at you from a long distance. In order to make serious headway here, at some point, you have to run down into the belly of the beast. Thanks to the sheer number of enemies here, survival is a fleeting hope. Ellie could usually take a couple out, but would be swiftly overwhelmed soon thereafter. She was beginning to hit a bit of a wall as she tried to push through this section. Despite her growing frustration, Ellie was demonstrating what she had learned from watching my analysis of her Dark Souls play. For example, she was becoming more comfortable with targeting enemies, something that makes reliably hitting your opponent much easier. She'd often make note of something that she was trying based upon the feedback that she's received from either myself or those of you that left comments on the previous video and locking onto enemies was a perfect example. Despite this, Ellie was still refraining from incorporating evasion into her combat tactics. When she was faced with an enemy, her approach was to eliminate that enemy as quickly as possible. This is a very sensible methodology, but the combat in From games is a bit more contemplative in nature, at least in my experience. I found that a well-timed dodge roll to evade an incoming attack is often the difference between life and death. Despite learning my philosophy from the last video, Ellie was still opting to focus almost entirely on offense. Now, while I think that makes combat more difficult overall, Bloodborne does reward that more aggressive style of play, as I mentioned earlier earlier. In this game, when an enemy attacks you, you actually have a chance to earn that health back. If you counterattack an enemy quickly enough after taking damage, you can actually refill the section of your health bar that was lost. Even if you can't earn it all, clawing back even a bit of lost health is extremely beneficial in combat. I'm not sure the degree to which she was even focused on the mechanic, but Ellie was constantly recovering health thanks to her offensive style of play. About halfway through Hour 2, Ellie managed to clear out the town square and began cautiously moving forward to see what lay ahead. After a small reprieve and some bizarre, seizing crows, she found herself in dangerous territory with some more townsfolk, but more importantly, a pack of dog-like creatures. These guys are really fast and highlight even more so how easy it is to become overwhelmed and taken over by enemies if you're not careful. I feared this may spell the end for her, but Ellie managed to fell them all. She emerged victorious, but was almost immediately accosted by an angry giant of sorts and ran off. She managed to elude him and ran up to a bridge. Now, if I were providing assistance, I'd advise Ellie to walk over this bridge. This leads to a very convenient shortcut and eventually the first boss. Reaching the first boss will also enable Ellie to begin leveling up, which she isn't able to do currently. Unfortunately though, Ellie fell down into a hole when exploring another path. She dropped deeper down into the bowels of Yarnum, quickly meeting a new, more difficult type of enemy. She almost managed to bring it down, but was felled and forced to respawn all the way back at the lamp. It was at this point that the frustration really started to hit, and I don't blame her one bit. It can't be overstated how maddening it is to be placed all the way back at the starting point after making so much progress forward. Any From fan knows this pain, but Ellie was doing an admirable job of maintaining her composure when she would die. Like last time, her primary point of concern wasn't having to replay the same section, but the fact that such repetition would ultimately make for a less interesting video. I assured her that the video would be fine no matter how she played, and she pressed onward, but it was clear that she'd fallen into a rut. The telltale sign of any player's patience draining is a tendency to run past rank and file enemies, and Ellie was beginning to do just that. As Hour 2 wrapped up, it was clear that Ellie was in need of a break. Between Hours 2 and 3, Ellie got just that. She emerged recharged, I think, and stood ready, or at least willing, to jump back in. She quickly re-familiarized herself with the route that she'd been taking, but was still dying while trying to eliminate all the enemies at the town square. It didn't take long for frustration to reintroduce itself. This impasse was making Ellie feel completely stagnant, but I would disagree. It's clear that she's developing a From Software literacy. For example, she was consistently locking on to enemies. Had she not watched the previous video and unpacked it with me, she wouldn't have thought to do that. I'm not sure that she was sold on the value of locking on, but just practicing the mechanic is what's so valuable. She also expressed stress that she hadn't yet figured out how to level up, an expectation that she now possessed after learning from Dark Souls. I did let her know that she wasn't able to level up at this point so that she could more easily focus on making progress. Seeing Ellie's knowledge base expand was really cool, but ultimately, knowledge isn't enough. 
Bloodborne demands that you execute, and despite a stronger sense of understanding the game, Ellie just needed more practice. Sometimes, she'd forget to pay attention to her health bar. Other times, as I mentioned, she'd neglect to incorporate evasion into combat. Slip-ups like these are inevitable for anyone, but the more time you get with a game, the less often they occur. At one point, Ellie switched over to the two-handed version of her weapon, granting her a wider area of attack, but it was only helping her so much. Further into the hour, Ellie once again managed to make it through the town square. Now, she'd already done this once before, but this time felt different. Ellie had been through many more failed attempts to reach this point, and as desperate as she was not to repeat everything again, she really started to feel the pressure. Pressure makes humans perform differently than they would normally, and one's performance in pressure-filled video games can often suffer. I can't even begin to count the number of times that I've screwed up in a game because I was so fixated on the grave consequences for losing. In this instance, Ellie knew them all too well, so she proceeded with extreme caution. I too felt a pit in my stomach as I ultimately want her to be as successful as possible. There were some really close calls during that dog section, like, thought she was a goner, but once again, she managed to pull it off. She did a great job of trying to tackle the enemies piecemeal, but also wasn't afraid to go for the kill shot. Ellie once again made it up to the bridge, and once again opted to head back down to Lower Yarnum. The first time was an accident, but this time, she wanted to see what it held. At this point, Ellie was just desperate for a checkpoint, and I can only assume this is where she felt most likely to find one. She was once again greeted with this new enemy type, and while they put up a fight, Ellie was able to take three of them down. Two-handing the weapon seemed to be serving her well. She poured over the area, presumably looking for a lamp to light, and as she was doing so, I noticed that she didn't realize how low her health was. I tensely waited as she stood over some rats and decided to lob a Molotov cocktail. Unfortunately, she didn't realize that throwing an item causes you to take a step forward, which resulted in her falling down below. Panicked, she attempted to climb back up the ladder, but was killed by a lunging rat, and just like that, all her progress was erased. At this point, Ellie's optimism had reached an all-time low. I received some feedback in the comments of the last video that it might be helpful for me to provide some tips or advice to Ellie as she plays. I didn't want to provide direct instruction for what to do next, so I instead posed a question to her. Why did you die? Confused, Ellie requested clarification. What I meant by that question is that it's incredibly helpful to diagnose each death as you play through a game. Ellie's knee-jerk response was that the enemies had killed her, but I encouraged her to look deeper. For example, her rat death occurred for two primary reasons. Firstly, she threw an item too close to a ledge, putting her in harm's way. Secondly, she wasn't paying attention to her health, preventing her from sustaining any additional damage once she fell. Let's take another death. It's easy to say here that Ellie died simply because there were too many enemies, but that's not why she died. She failed here because she didn't utilize evasion. A couple of well-timed dodge rolls could have enabled her to handle the group. Posing this question may not sound all that helpful, but if you think about it, there's always a path to achieve victory in any scenario. By pinpointing the specific reasons that defeat occurred instead, you can train your mind not to make those same mistakes as often. As Ellie chewed on this little nugget, Hour 3 wrapped up. Hours 4 and 5 in the Dark Souls video, while certainly very interesting, found Ellie falling into a rut. Given how events appeared to be transpiring, I feared that she may fall victim to the same trajectory here. I'm happy to say that I couldn't have been more wrong. In fact, Hour 4 was my favorite hour of Ellie's gameplay across both games. She'd had a few days to decompress since Hour 3, and came back with a whole new outlook on the game. Ellie's strategy was no longer to brute force her way through the mobs in an effort to claw her way just a little bit forward. She decided to predicate her play on the world around her. She walked over to a locked gate by the spawn point that proclaimed it couldn't be opened on this side. Ellie assumed that there must be a way to open this gate. It wouldn't be there for no reason, so there had to be a way to reach the other side and open it from there. Opening this gate became her self-imposed mission. She began her search by running back towards the very starting area of the game. On her trek, she encountered another locked gate that she'd breezed past before. This time, she discovered a lever that opened said gate up. Now, this shortcut doesn't really do that much for the player, but when she died a few minutes later, it taught her an incredibly valuable lesson. After she respawned, she looked back down at the gate to see that it was still open. It clicked that opening a new route is permanent. No matter how many times you die, that progress won't be erased. This further galvanized Ellie to find a way to open that other gate. 
Ellie began back over to the town square, playing slowly and carefully as she'd run out of blood vials and needed to replenish her stock. She picked off enemies at a solid clip using her gun as a lure, and before she knew it, had mopped up every enemy. She moved on to the next area, and this is where things get even more interesting. Still intent on really grounding herself in Bloodborne's world, Ellie moves more slowly and took the time to destroy various crates and coffins. In doing so, she revealed a path that I didn't even remember was there. This was a huge moment, and it provided Ellie with massive motivation to push onward. Attempting the same stretch over and over again is like chewing a piece of gum that's progressively losing its flavor. Finding this new area, though, is like chewing an entirely new piece. Ellie can continued forward, cautiously examining around quarters to see if there were any enemies lying in wait. She eventually discovered what appeared to be a house and opened a couple of doors, wondering if the opened gate permanence would apply to them as well. Before she could spend too much time pondering the question, she made a euphoric discovery. It was the gate. The gate that Ellie had set off to open. Of course, she didn't realize that she was heading right for it, but she'd found it nonetheless, thanks to a willingness to really soak in the space around her. This interest in exploring unlocked an entirely new route for her, and with it came an invaluable shortcut. Now, she'd never have to visit the town square again. All of this progress was made in just 30 minutes. With half of the hour remaining, Ellie sought out to explore more of the new zone. Soon enough, she stumbled onto a familiar-looking space, the Lower Yarnum Sewer Area. She was now approaching it from a different entrance. She didn't survive too long, but didn't even mind dying, given all that she'd discovered. She immediately ran back over, intent to see what else it contained. It's interesting to see how much Ellie immediately gravitated to this specific route. There were others she could take, but like before, she locked in and kept pursuing this one. I think part of the reason is that she was already familiar with it, perhaps making it seem like somewhere that she had to go. My memory of Bloodborne is foggy, so I'm really not sure if she had to go here at all, but it's ultimately good that she did, as on one attempt, she made it all the way to the bottom and discovered Madman's Knowledge. This item is extremely helpful, as using it enables the player to begin leveling up. My fear was that Ellie wouldn't give it a second look, but for some reason, this item in particular prompted her to examine it more deeply. She used it, wasn't sure what the point was, and moved on. Ellie proceeded deeper into Yarnum, discovering new sights and enemies, including a bridge with a giant flaming ball, but was eventually felled. However, she respawned in the Hunter's Dream because she had used the Madman's knowledge. She spoke to the newly present woman and discovered that she could now level up. By this point, Hour 4 had pretty much expired. In just one hour, Ellie managed to unlock a hugely valuable shortcut, see more of the game that she had in the preceding three hours combined, and gained access to one of Bloodborne's most important mechanics. It was excellent gameplay and made possible by, in a word, experimentation. Something I've mentioned to Ellie multiple times when we've discussed games is the irrefutable value of experimenting. It's easy to get locked into the same pattern, especially in a game as challenging as this one, but taking some time to try new things can make all the difference. The freedom to experiment is one of my favorite things about video games. I mean, if I pick up and use a skull in real life, there's probably gonna be consequences for that. Not so in a virtual world. The worst thing that can happen is game over, which is really just a rite of passage if you're gonna play video games. As we began Hour 5 a few days later, it felt like Ellie was taking a victory lap. She had made so much progress already that this just felt like icing on the cake. Regardless, I was excited to see what else she could do. She returned to the sewers, and after dying, decided that she wanted to go try leveling up. She had accrued a good number of blood echoes, but didn't realize that she was losing them upon death. When she tried to level up, she was confused as to where they had gone, as she had just recently noticed how many she had. I prompted her to consider what had happened between then and now, and she quickly made the connection that death was right robbing her of the echoes. Thankfully, she had some cold blood dew on her hands, an item that provides instant blood echoes, so she was still able to level up. Soon thereafter, Ellie's weapon was noted to be at risk. This exact same thing happened while she was playing Dark Souls, which gave her a lot of trouble, but now she understood what that meant. She returned to the Hunter's Dream and fortified her weapon, as she'd seen this option much earlier in the game. I've mentioned this already, but it was so clear at this point how much of a fluency Ellie was developing with From Software titles. It's not to say that there wasn't more to learn, but her capacity to address complications as they arose was becoming much greater. And that was reflected in her enjoyment, as Ellie was having a much 
much better time with Bloodborne than she did with Dark Souls. Beyond just liking the world more, she felt that the game was much better at onboarding her. Hunter's Dream was a good example of this, as having a safe hub in which to take a breather made things feel a lot more manageable. Without question though, the biggest contributor to her increased enjoyment was her increased skill level. Ellie was clearly getting better as she played and was no doubt developing her sea legs as it were. At the end of the day, everything is more fun when you're good at it and Ellie was experiencing this firsthand. As the clock wound down, Ellie decided to try to lean back into experimentation. She had nothing to lose, so she wanted to poke around and see what else she could find. She tried fighting the troll enemies, from which she'd always run and almost managed to take two of them down, and scoped out a couple of different routes that she'd not paid mind to previously, narrowly evading a giant hog of some sort in the process. She eventually made it back to the bridge with the flaming ball, and managed to make it to the end where she found another troll, but couldn't quite take him down. At this point, time was almost up, so I told Ellie that she had one last life to do whatever she wanted. She skillfully navigated all the way back to the bridge and this time just ran around the troll. She sprinted all the way into the domain of Father Gascoin, the first time that Ellie faced off against a boss in Bloodborne. Again, my memory of this game is a bit foggy, but I think the Cleric Beast is generally considered to be the first boss of the game sequentially, but Ellie had managed to skip right to this one. She wasn't able to survive for very long, but it served as a climactic conclusion to her Bloodborne escapades. I'm thoroughly impressed with Ellie's performance. Despite racking up 52 deaths during her exploration of Yharnam, Ellie wasn't discouraged and was even interested in continuing the game. Maybe in the future, we'll get a chance to put that persistence to the test.